Hello, hello, and welcome. Welcome once again to the Secrets of the High Demand Coach. And I am here with an unbelievably high demand coach, and that is the one, the only Robert Indries. Now, he was born into a modest family in a tiny town in Transylvania, Romania. And he spent the first part of his life on farms, caring for livestock and working the land. Uh, traveling allowed him to observe common mistakes and successes in businesses all over the world. He'd visited 17 countries and spoke in front of thousands of people in three different languages. Now, throughout the years, he's also generated over 500 million. I had to count all the zeros here. 500 million in business value for his clients, delivered over 200 projects for clients in 19 sectors, and consulted with over 1,000 professionals to achieve two to 10 times higher levels of effectiveness. He's here with us today. Robert, welcome to the show. So excited to have you here. Uh, before we dive into some of this really cool work that you're doing with your clients, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about this story. So you grew up on a farm in Romania. Walk us through you know, how that led you to where you are today. Well, growing up in uh, Romania isn't all that special. What is special in our specific area of Transylvania is that um, there is a very high number of Hungarians there. And I was one of them, or I am one of them, right? So when the Austro-Hungarian Empire you know, lost the Second World War, um, this part, at that point in time, this part was part of Hungary. And then they had to give this part back to Romania. Wow. So you can imagine the conflict, the tensions, the the mini battles that people were fighting here, you know, day in, day out. Hey, this is Romania. And Hungarians were like, no, this is Hungary, you know. So it, it, it wasn't easy. And um, you end up building quite a bit of character from that, right? Because um, what ends up happening is that you are put in front of situations where um, people either bully you or they, you know, don't respect you or they uh, disconsider you. And so in a realm like that, you can either choose to soften up um, and, you know, just allow yourself to be pushed around or uh, let's say strengthen up or however you want to call it, you know? And so I was very lucky to live in a loving family. So I, I was born with both of my parents alive and there, and, you know, they were uh, both educating me and, you know, helping me. And so I, I feel that's one of the biggest, let's say, blessings uh, of my life that I was born into a loving family because no matter how, um, dangerous the world seemed outside. I knew I could come home and it would be safe and peaceful and so on. So that gave me strength and courage to go out every day, right? And, you know, do what I had to do. I remember when I was very young, my, my mother was called into school very often because I would always get in fights because you know, I would be pushed around by Romanians and I'd just fight back. <laughs> so you really do end up building character and, um, from that, it, it's you. You have this inner urge of, okay, what else is there? You know, like what more can I do? This can't be, you know, everything that that life has to give. You know, and so what I really enjoy doing, and this is, you know, thanks to my father and my mother as well. But uh, my father was a very big influence in this se sector. I would read books and, and, you know, um, browse through books and so on, because that's the only thing that they would give me money for. <laughs> Not the, everything else was, you know, uh, off limits, but books I could buy. So, um, I told this story a few times, but at one point I came across the evolution of technology, a huge book, beautiful images, and that really got me hooked into engineering. And so I was about 10 years old and I really started loving engineering. I, I started learning programming. I started disassembling everything that had a motherboard. I started learning You know, I got my bachelor's in science um, and I got my master's in science. So I really love this stuff and um, it made me pursue more. So I left my 
home, my childhood home when I was 14, went to a much, much larger city. I stayed there for four or five years. Then I left again um, to various other countries to learn more, to do all types of cool projects. Um, I went to Italy. I went to Siberia. I went to Mexico. I went anywhere there were cool projects and cool things to do. I would just go. And uh, obviously every time I would do that, my parents would get a mini heart attack, you know, because I would be, you know, who knows where on the planet, you know, I was, I, I, I remember the youngest I was, I think I was at one point, I was 15 and I hitchhiked like 900 kilometers or something like that. I, I just hitchhiked because I wanted to get somewhere for a conference and uh, I, I didn't want to tell them because I knew that they were not going to let me do it. Um, and so I just left at one point with, you know, my rucksack and two, it took me two days to get there. So I had to sleep where I could. But, um, once I was there, I called him like, Hey, I'm here. It's like, what do you mean you're there? How, where, when do you get there? Like I got here a few minutes ago, but I didn't <laughs> want to tell you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it was fun for me and very exciting, very adventurous, but I think it was horrifying for my parents. Um, I hope my children don't do that to me, or at least if they do it, they, they remain safe, you know? Um, so in, in, in the way I am, you know, very adventurous and, you know, very, let's say, um, determined to put in the work because when you were young, no one asked you if you want to work, you would just work. Like it, I can't remember any part of my life when I wasn't working, like the youngest memory I have was when I was like five years old and I was already habitually working by five, right? I was doing anything that needed to be done on the farm. So from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep, there's some form of work to be done. And so I just took that into my teens and adulthood and, you know, progressed from there. Yeah. Well, so when did the uh, when did the entrepreneurial bug bite? Well, when did you really get into launching, and and what was your first real successful business endeavor? So, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to be an engineer. Since I was ten years old, I always wanted to be an engineer, and I started getting all types of jobs, and I had around. I don't want to exaggerate, but maybe five, six jobs and in different countries, different industries, different roles, right? And I realized that in none of those jobs did the company actually care about me. And that was strange because that felt opposite to how a company's culture should be. And so I, I was constantly shocked at how mistreated people are in companies. And I, right. I didn't understand why, why that's going on. Now I understand because now I've dealt with employees and I know what the pain they can be, right? And so it's incredibly hard to find one that's actually loyal, that's, you know, actually there and puts in the hard work and so on. I mean, you might need to hire 10 people and nine of them lied on this, on the interview, their CVs puffed up, you know, and so on. And one of them may be that A player that you were looking for. You know, and but you might lose fifty thousand dollars searching for that or more. You know, who knows? The cost of a bad hire is enormous, especially at bigger companies. So, um, basically, I couldn't find my place in employment, and so at one point I said, "Look, excuse my French, but screw this. I'm going to start my own company and you know hire people and treat them the way companies should treat people, right? Like care about them, put them first, and so on." So. In our companies, the client isn't always right. Um, if the client calls us and says, hey, this and this and this isn't okay, first thing we do is we do an analysis. We ask everyone that was involved what actually happened, what's going on, right? And we have a very objective, unbiased approach. And uh, then we have a conversation with the client and say, no, look, this actually happened. And this was an internal communication issue in your company. So solve that first, and then probably this won't happen again, right? Yeah. So we've had conversations like that so many times because we protect our uh, employees as much as we can. And again, we don't protect them like uh, in a biased way. We always try to find the objective reality of what actually happened, yeah. what should have happened, 
and then what led to it not going the way everyone wanted it to, right? And so with that analysis we do, and we don't consider the client always, right? So that's one thing, and we do various other things, like we have unlimited vacation days, so whenever someone wants to, you know, take off, if it's a Wednesday and they're not feeling good, they can just take off, right? They just need to tell their manager and make sure whatever task, if they had anything urgent that someone else helps them tackle that. But otherwise, uh, it's um, very, very forgiving, let's say, from that perspective, and so on and so forth. So that was my first company, and that was, I believe, 11 years ago, a little bit more. And that company is still alive and thriving today. Uh, it's making millions a year, right? It has been making millions for four or five years now or more. I don't even know, like half a decade it's been making millions. And uh, since then, I've added 10 other companies to my portfolio, and a few of them we've already sold off. Wow. So, you know, managing a business is hard enough. Uh, I, a lot, as I checked, I was doing some research, I think you've got around eight, something like that. Uh, and the, uh, the fact that it might be higher, it might be lower, is just indicative of how much work that actually is. So, like, how... How do you manage all these different organizations and, and, and continue to lead them to success? So I have, as I mentioned, an engineering background. So everything in the world for me is ones and zeros, everything. Like there's the numbering starts at zero. So up until 10, you have 11 numbers, right? Any, I can explain it to anyone, <laughs> but uh, it's everything is zero and one. There is no chicken and egg situation. There is no gray area. Anyone that wants any form of clarity, I can tell them first was the egg and then was the chicken because there were no chicken. There were just lizards and lizards made eggs. And at one point, one of those eggs made a chicken. That's it. End of story, right? So there is no gray area, right? Either you're, you're telling the truth or you're lying. I'm not saying you're intentionally lying. I'm just saying it can't be a half truth. It's either the truth or it's a lie. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you have, let's say, someone calls it the half truth because half of what they said is true. In mathematics, that doesn't exist. It's either one or it's a zero. So if half of it is false, that means the entire thing is false. Because if part of something is false, the entire thing me means the entire thing is false. So if someone, for example, forgets to do something in a business, right? Like they forget to follow up with someone. Then what that means is that the system that reminds that person that they need to follow up, and then if they actually do not follow up and mark it as complete, automatically escalates that to their manager, that system isn't working, right? And so it doesn't matter what you tell me in terms of, you know, why you didn't follow up. The truth is that you haven't. What comes after you haven't doesn't matter in terms of changing reality. Reality is you should have followed up, you have it. I'm not here to blame, I'm not here to point fingers, I'm not here to judge. What I am here to do is to seek excellence. And excellence works in zeros and ones. It's either excellent or it's not, right? Well, There's no middle area, right? So if you didn't follow up, let's look into it. I'm not I'm not yelling at you. I'm I'm not scolding you. I'm just asking, okay, why didn't you follow up? I forgot. Okay, but this system reminds you to um to follow up. How did you miss that? Well, the truth is I was off because this and this and this. Okay, so you weren't at your office. That's what really happened. Mm -hmm. And so we need to put a system in place that if you're not at the office, we should know, right? And then you build a policy that says, hey, if you're off, let someone know you're off so that if anything is urgent, the manager knows to take care of it when you're not there, right? Et cetera, et cetera. I'm not here to seek blame. I'm here to seek excellence, right? And so it's not easy to work with us because this is what how our culture functions. We don't tolerate mediocrity. We tolerate excellence. So if someone joins our company, they might be mediocre when they join. But if they stay with us, they'll definitely leave a professional. They'll leave someone that's outstanding in whatever role they chose for themselves, right? And so, and you can ask, 
anyone that we've worked with for years, they will tell you the same thing. They, they join us as juniors or mid-level. They leave as seniors, you know, veterans in their field. Um, if they leave, because we have people that have been with us for and six, seven years. I, I don't even, I'm losing count of how much people stay with us. So it's, uh, it's that form of mentality. And so what we do, because you also, um, told me, you know, in, in private before the call that we should talk a little bit about, um, how we use what we have to help the world as well, is that whenever someone comes to us and says, Hey, I have two businesses or I have one business, I have this, I have that, whatever, and I'd like it to go better. I'd like it to grow. I'd like it to, you know, not be so dependent on me. Whatever the challenge is, we look at it as ones and zeros. What's reality? We show them the factual reality. We do an analysis in one to two months of everything in the business. We show them this is the factual reality. Whether you decide to accept it or not, that's secondary, right? And if you accept reality, you know, then we can help you. If you don't accept that this is what's real, then maybe we can help you because your blind spots uh, or your ego, one or the other, or both, right, are um, a very big bottleneck in the growth of the company. And yeah. you are the owner. At the end of the day, I can't grow beyond you. You need to grow with us, right? Like you as the owner. So the owner has to understand what we're saying and do his own analysis if he wants to and come back with his data and prove to us that we're not right or whatever. We accept that and we've been wrong thousands of times, right? It's not like we have all of the answers. And so when we get to a common consensus, we say, okay, year one, these are the things we're going to change. And then all of a sudden, I can tell you countless stories of someone coming to us, for example, saying, Robert, I have a $20 million business. I've been working on it for the past 20 years, right? But I feel I want to go to the next level. I feel I want to grow better. I feel like I don't want the business so dependent on me, blah, blah, blah. And so guess what? That one specific case study I'm thinking about, it took them 20 years to get to 20 million. And then in three years, we took them to 50 million. Right, literally, it exploded because everything was already there. We just needed to remove the owner and then, you know, put everything in place so that it just grows, you know, at, like crazy. So we do that over and over and over again. Some companies we work with make half a million a year. Right, that's fine. We don't judge everyone somewhere on their path. Others are at five million. Others are at a hundred million. Right, and we just take the companies wherever they are and then help them, you know, to leave a higher impact all the time. Um, the only one thing that we don't do is we do not help in industries that we believe um, are uh, have negative effects on the world, right? I mean, everything is yin and yang. Everything has good and bad. Don't get me wrong. However, there are some industries that literally just do damage to the world. You know, like I can say tobacco or, you know, whatever, alcohol. There's no quantity of alcohol that's good for you. I don't, if anyone listening, you know, likes to drink, I don't judge you. I really want to make that clear. Just, I don't want to help a company that helps you drink more than you already do. That's it. It's just simple as that, right? Or I don't want to help a company that helps you smoke more than you already do, right? Again, I'm not judging you for doing anything. I have my own uh, vices. Uh, and there's this, um, there's this interesting saying that I really love. Don't judge me just because I sin differently than you do. Mm. Because we all sin. It's just we sin differently, each one of us. So yeah. I'm not going to judge you for your sins. And, you know, hopefully I get the same um, in return. Well, so you've got this whole breadth of experience. You're working in so many different industries, um, so many different challenges that you guys have overcome, so many success stories. If you were to boil all that down, what would you say is the biggest secret you wish wasn't a secret at all? What's that one thing that you wish everybody listening or watching today knew? A lot. I thought I was going to be prepared for these questions, but I'm not. Uh, I feel, if I think about it, that the one thing that people miss in their careers, in their lives, and so on and so forth, 
is that on very many occasions, they forget that um, love is the answer. It's always love, right? If if you have a client that's being problematic, you go to that call not with fear, not with anger, not with anything else other than love. And you ask them, Mr. Client, what's wrong? Lovingly, kindly, no patronizing, no sarcasm, no anything, pure love, pure understanding, pure desire to do good, to help them to, you know, find an ethical path forward and so on and so forth. And the same, if someone in your life does or says something that you consider that they shouldn't have done or said, you go to them with love. You say, my dear, why would you say that? Right? And they're like, well, I'm very angry. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you're angry. Why are you angry? Well, because you said this. Okay, do you believe that what I said was uncalled for? No, it's it's the way you said it. Okay, I'm sorry if that felt um, harmful. I will try to do better next time. Um, what do you think about the message itself, about the contents of the message? Do you believe it's true? Do you believe it's false? What What do you feel? And then you can continue having a loving conversation mm. with your you know, um, clients, with your colleagues, with your family, with anyone. And love is the answer with you as well, with yourself, right? If you do something you feel that you shouldn't have done or said, or you've you've fallen short with anything, criticism, self-criticism, self-loathing, all of those things do not help. What helps is to say, oh dear, you've eaten cake again. You promised yourself you wouldn't. What happened? What's wrong? Well, I was at the party and everyone was eating cake. Okay, but did we tell everyone at the party that we don't eat cake? Well, yes, we have when we were there, but everyone was, you know, insisting. Okay, well, what if we call everyone, especially the the hosts of the party, and we tell them that we really feel bad for eating cake the other day, and we really wish on their next party that if they wouldn't insist that we eat cake again. Mm. Right. And we have a very firm and honest and loving conversation with them. And guess what? There's only so many times you need to do this before everyone in your network knows that you don't eat cake. And then it will be much easier for you next time. Right. And you will notice that once you set this expectation a few times, I'll give you one example. I don't drink alcohol or I, if I drink, I drink maybe twice a year, three times a year, whatever. And so when I go to a, a specific part of the family, there's this uncle that always is like, hey, come, then don't you want to drink? I'm like, no, I already told you a hundred times and I'm going to drink, right? The first time you tell them lovingly, second time you tell them lovingly. By the third time, even you get upset, right? So now, all of a sudden, this habit that you don't want to keep, whenever someone asks you to indulge in it, now you get upset. Because you now feel attacked by someone, you know, wanting to go against what you want for yourself. And now you don't attack them. Again, love is the answer, but you're more firm. And you say, I've already told you three times that I do not want to drink. I say, well, yeah, but I just want you to feel well. I feel well when I am accepted. And I do not feel accepted if you do not accept me as a non-drinker. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah, you don't need to take it so seriously, blah, blah, I'm not taking anything more or less than it really is. The reality is that you've asked me four times if I want to drink, and each and every single time I told you, no, I do not drink. So there's a message somewhere in there. I would really love for you to find it, (laughs) right? So you can have these conversations with anyone, but again, with love with love, not anger, not fear, not anything. If you're fearful, that means something can go wrong. Listen to that fear and create a plan so you avoid whatever can go wrong, but create the plan lovingly, execute on it lovingly, talk with everyone lovingly, and so on and so forth. Wow. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, I love that idea of, of uh, yeah, yeah, listen to the fear because it's not always wrong, but it's not always right either, right? Uh, so that idea of making a plan, being loving in the way, uh, is just gold in that. Uh, Thank you for sharing. Now, I'm going to have you shift gears a little bit. I'm going to have you take off your advisor hat for a moment, put on your CEO hat. 
Dr. Just, what's the next stage of growth look like for you as a leader and what challenge will you have to overcome to get there? Well, so far, um, I have had the privilege and blessing to pass a million dollars by the time I was 25 and I passed 10 million by the time I was 31. So now my next goal is to pass 100 million. That's uh, in my career, the next, let's say, goalpost. And I will do that via a new company that I am starting this year that I am now looking for investment for. And so if anyone on the call is an investor or, you know, knows someone, they can obviously introduce us and I can share with them what I have. Um, however, they need to have significant capital. <laughs> they can just come, come, you know, with 50 grand or whatever, because I've passed that game a while ago. I don't want to be disrespectful to anyone. However, I don't want to make millions anymore. I don't even want to make tens of millions. I want to make hundreds of millions, right? And so it's a different game. I need uh, quite a bit of capital to uh, allocate, to make it happen. And so I'm looking for investors right now. Hopefully I can find investment in this first half of the year and then start the company and then see where it takes us. By my calculation, I should hopefully pass 100 million by the time I'm 40, but you don't know. Exciting time, times. time will tell. <laughs> Exciting times. I love it. Uh, how can folks find more out uh, about you, your company, and, and how they might be able to partner together with you in the future? So if they want to learn anything about me, they just need to Google my name. And, you know, the first, I don't know how many pages should be all about me. Um, I do have a website, myfullname.com. So it's robertindriesh.com. And if anyone wants to speak with me directly, they just need to email me at robertindriesh.com and mention either your name, Scott, or the podcast name. And I promise to reply personally. Fantastic. Well, Robert, uh, just an honor having you on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, for everyone listening, we'll drop those in the show notes so you can just click on them right there. You don't have to track it all down. Uh, and for everyone watching and listening, you know that your time and attention mean the world to us. I hope you got as much out of this conversation as I know I did, and I cannot wait to see you next time. Take care.